Run! Really? It's not safe out there. There's a saber-toothed tiger looking around. You better be careful. What are you doing? Don't peek. Okay, just one little peek. How's this possible, you ask? That's because you're in virtual reality, of course. These cool but very dangerous-looking big cats were alive during the last ice age. What if they decided to show up at your doorstep out of nowhere? Knock, knock! A saber-toothed tiger is waiting for you to buy its cookies. Meanwhile, the coelacanth, this massive-looking fish, comes from a lineage that's been around for over 300 million years. We thought they didn't exist anymore until 1938, that is, when a live coelacanth was found again. Since then, they've been roaming the waters of the east coast of Africa and the waters of Sulawesi, Indonesia. Man, I wouldn't want to go for a swim and meet one of these fellas face to face. Their jaw has an intracranial joint, which means their mouth opens up by a lot. This is so they can eat large prey, like me. Not good. They're huge, too. Imagine a fish that's as long as you're tall and weighing as much as an average human. The Takahe, a flightless bird, was thought to be gone in the year 1898. They're very cute, small and multicolored, usually not taller than your knee. But picture this. You're out for a hike in the Murkison Mountains. Looking around, you spot the bird you thought was extinct. But there they are, as happy as ever, surviving and chilling. A whole colonies of Takahe's was indeed found just 50 years after they were pronounced extinct. Good job, tiny little birds! A singing dog. Ever heard of those? Riley does sing sometimes when he's bored or hungry, but these are real performers. New Guinea singing dogs. They've been only recently discovered again in the wild for the first time in 50 years. Still, they were never completely extinct to begin with. New Guineans made sure they were safe next to them. But in the wild? Very rare and hard to catch a sight of. Look, there goes one. The New Guinea singing dogs are called so because of their famous high-pitched singing. They sometimes sing together, too. A dog choir of sorts, where they all howl together. I bet they sing better than I do in the shower. Not going far from this area, we have bats. But these ones are sort of different. You see, their ears are enormous. I guess that's why they're called the New Guinea big-eared bats. Clever. The species was found again when one of them was accidentally caught in a bat trap. Until then, I guess they were playing hide-and-seek with us, because up till 1890, they had been thought to be gone. They're still not out of the danger zone because of habitat loss. Imagine you discover a fossil of a species you thought had been extinct for a long time. Yet, two years later, a whole living group of said species is found. Well, this is exactly what happened in 1977 with the Majorcan midwife toad. It's sort of brownish in color with darker brown that makes up its skin spots. Other than that, it's just a small toad with googly eyes. The group of live toads was found close to where the fossil was on the island of Majorca. There aren't many of them left, about 500 in fact, and as of right now, they're declared vulnerable by the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Now, are you a fan of tortoises? You will be when you take a look at this huge beauty. It's called the Ferdinanda Island Galapagos tortoise. It hasn't been seen since 1906. But on February 17, 2019, we were finally able to look at one of these beautiful creatures. It's probably out there with a few of its mates right now. But they also don't allow themselves to be seen. We only know they exist because there's a few tracks and scents. With yet another frog, we have the horned marsupial frog. They're out and about in Ecuador, in the Chaco forest to be more specific. They're called this way because of their distinctive horns directly on top of their eyes. You know the pouch kangaroos use to carry their offspring? Well, the female horned marsupial frog also has that, except it's on the back, so it acts as sort of a backpack. They develop their embryos there, and when they're ready to come out, they hatch as complete infants, unlike regular frogs where they start out as tadpoles. One more toad, the starry night toad or harlequin toad. They're black and covered with loads of white spots all over them. 
Lost for 30 years, it was discovered back in 2019. Picture them as big bodyguards, water bodyguards to be exact. Oh, that's a very big toad on your screen. Well, for the Arawako people, that's exactly what they are, guardians of water. They also have their own name for them, Guna. Sounds like a cheese. When scientists found them yet again, they came across 30 of these little creatures. But initially, they were expecting only one. Well, what a nice surprise. Here's a tiger for you, although it doesn't quite look like your typical tiger. It's called the Tasmanian tiger, and it seemingly disappeared since 1936. But then, out of nowhere, people started seeing them out there in the wild just five years ago in 2016. They sort of resemble dogs more than tigers, or a fox maybe. Just take a look at its muzzle. Maybe even a mix of both. Then, a few others started popping up too. And if you happen to think you're seeing one right in front of you, but you're not quite sure, check if they've got stripes on their back. They're definitely out there, but still technically marked as extinct by the IUCN. Okay, picture a horse that looks straight out of a movie scene. Tiny, gorgeous fur, very well behaved. It's tiny, but it's not a pony. It's a Caspian horse. They have an interesting backstory to them. They were discovered by Louise Leyland, who got married to an aristocrat in 1957. Having moved to Tehran, Iran, she didn't quite like how the horses behaved there, so she took matters into her own hands. She took a few people with her, and off they went to the Caspian Sea Mountain. And in there, they found three of these beautiful tiny little horses. Now that's how the story goes. Coming up next, a possum that was found in an unexpected place. Guess where? You have three options to pick from. Hiding in a ski resort, in the Australian outback, or in someone's apartment in the bathroom. Which one do you choose? You have three seconds. The right answer is a ski resort. Yes, this possum is called the mountain pygmy possum, and it's originating from Australia. So far, there are three different living populations of this tiny possum, but it was believed to be extinct until just 1966. There are fewer than 100 of them, so the IUCN has marked them as critically endangered. Also from Australia is the night parrot, an absolute delight to birdwatchers. Very beautiful, yet mysterious. These little fellas live in very remote areas. You can probably count on the fingers of your hand how many times these birds have been seen since they were found again in 1979. That's how rare they are. Have you ever seen a pygmy tarsier? Neither have I. It was only in 2008 that three of them were caught. Scientists don't really want to lose track of their movements again, so what they did was gift them with tiny little collars. This way they can live their life as happy as ever and will know they're safe. The last one I want to tell you about is the tree lobster. But as the name might mistakenly tell you, they're not really lobsters. They're just big black bugs with huge legs. Their extinction story is a sad one. In 1920, a cargo ship got stuck on Lord Howe Island, and it had rats aboard. These rats fled the ship and ran straight to land. Even though tree lobsters are bigger than most insects, they're still relatively small compared to rats. The poor things never stood a chance. Still, in 2004, life shone again for these distinct critters. A pair of Australian scientists were out and about on the island and came across 24 of them. All of them were living beneath one single shrub. Hey, if there's enough space for everyone, it's not small, it's cozy. Bottom line, it's better to be distinct than extinct. Don't you agree? So Megalodon was one of the biggest and most ferocious monsters on our planet. Powerful jaws, razor-sharp teeth, gigantic eyes. But what do you know about how it sounded? Imagine how loudly it growled, permeating the underwater world with sound vibrations. This sound resembled nothing. Megalodon didn't have a voice. It was a shark, and sharks don't have sound-producing organs. It was a quiet danger. 
But despite its muteness, yes, that is a word, you could have still heard it. Come with me. Now you're under one, clenching your fist, raising your hand, and quickly bringing it down. Now imagine that you have a big submarine instead of a fist, and hear the water flowing around the smooth surface of the hull. That's what a megalodon sounded like. When this monster was swimming out to the surface and opening its jaws, it sounded like a waterfall. The giant shark swam at high speed. When the water was passing through its mouth and gills, it sounded like a flowing river, a fast, powerful river. Megalodon had no voice, only the scary sound of flowing water. Other ancient fish could make sounds, but you would hardly hear them. Whales, dolphins, and their distant ancestors are not counted because they're mammals. Fish communicated at frequencies elusive to human ears. They still have this ability, but in most, the ocean was and is a pretty quiet place. So let's get out on ancient lands and check what was going on with the sounds there. Thanks to modern technologies, scientists can analyze the sounds of many ancient animals. Using CT scans, they found that some dinosaurs had complex systems of small open pockets in their skulls. They used these winding cranial mazes to reproduce a wide range of sounds and regulate body temperature. And people have managed to hear them. An ancient bird that lived 79 to 140 million years ago, Vegasus, sounded similar to some farm birds like duck and geese. But the ancient creature probably screamed in a scarier way. Scientists found this out thanks to the Shrinks fossil they discovered in 2016 in Antarctica. It's the oldest known vocal organ in the world. It helped Vegasus make a double humming sound coming from the left and right sides of the Shrinks. Imagine a duck and goose screaming. Increase the volume several times. Perhaps that's what its distant ancestors sound like. As for other flying reptiles like the pterodactyl, it couldn't scream like Vegasus because it didn't have a syrinx. These winged monsters could growl, hiss, and snap their beaks, and this was their most effective sound. Remember any tall basketball player? The skull of the pterodactyl was slightly longer than their height. Just imagine what a noise the dinosaur created when it was snapping its powerful beak. The clicking sound could deafen and frighten other ancient creatures nearby. Now, you probably know what a Tyrannosaurus sounds like, thanks to the movies. Among thousands of others, you'll recognize this prolonged roar similar to a chainsaw, vacuum cleaner, and horn. And honestly, its roar has a lot in common with the natural sounds that this monster could make. Thanks to modern technologies and well-preserved remains, scientists managed to simulate the voice of these ancient animals. Imagine you're uploading data about a T-Rex into a program and preparing to hear an intimidating roar. You press play, and it sounds like a bee. Tyrannosaurus rex's scream was similar to birds, not mammals. But it wasn't just a bee. It used nostrils to scream, not a mouth. The hum came from the chest and resembled a siren with low bass. Maybe it sounded a lot more intimidating than what we saw in the movies. It was louder than all the trumpets of the symphony orchestra. And it did it only with the help of its nose. It's not known for sure whether it could growl through the mouth. You could also hear how long-necked dinosaurs sounded in the movies. Their calls were similar to those of elephants. Something between a saxophone and a car horn. But in fact, these tall creatures whispered. Almost all mammals make sounds thanks to the laryngeal nerve. This nerve runs down along the neck, then goes around the blood vessels of the chest and comes back to the larynx. In short, the brain gives a signal and it passes twice the distance along the body before the sound is released from the mouth. And now, remember those long necks of dinosaurs? This was the height of a five-story building. But the voice signal had to run a distance of 10 floors. It took too long to make this long trip, and this affected the dinosaur's roar. So when they wanted to make a sound, they just hissed. And it was probably similar to the sound of a giant viper. But the most detailed sounds scientists have managed to get belongs to the Parasaur olephus. You know this herbivorous dinosaur thanks to the long crest on the back of its head. We saw the dinosaur using it in movies and documentaries to fight opponents and enemies. Some scientists believed it also used the comb to drop fruits and leaves from trees. Others thought the dinosaur used it to improve its sense of smell. 
But it turned out that in addition to self-defense and fighting, they used the comb to make loud and scary sounds in different keys. Scientists replicated this with fantastic accuracy, thanks to the structure of its hard tissues. Almost all living beings with a voice use soft organs to make sounds. And these soft tissues decompose quickly. Pyrosaur olefus had solid ones. They noticed tubes leading from the nostrils to the crest and back to the nostrils when they found the skull. It was like a crumb horn, a curved musical wind instrument. This proved the dinosaur used the crest on the back of its head to make the sounds louder. The comb allowed it to trumpet, so its relatives could hear it in the forest. They made humming sounds with low and high notes. Mix a saxophone and trumpet with a goose hum, car horns, and low frequencies, then increase the volume several times. That's what Parasar Olafus sounded like. That's also what my fourth grade band sounded like. But I digress. You can listen to different shades and timbers of this dinosaur on the internet. It used noises with different tones to create complex social connections. They could communicate, identify each other, trumpet danger, or conversely, signal their friendly intentions. Alright, we've just heard how some ancient reptiles sounded. But what about ancient insects? They didn't have vocal cords, of course. Instead, they used friction between body parts. Look at modern crickets chirping with their wings. One wing has tiny notches. The second has the shape of a mediator. Take a simple plastic comb and run your fingertip over its teeth. Crickets make their sounds by the same principle. Their wings vibrate and release a series of sound waves into the air. But the clicking of an ancient bush cricket was very different from modern insects since they were much noisier. The sounds of these clicks were like a whistle. With the help of high-frequency waves, they could also communicate secretly as if they were doing it through a closed radio channel. If you heard this, you would hardly be able to fall asleep to it. Now, modern crickets are not so loud as they began to add more high frequencies to their sounds. Higher pitch waves don't spread as far, reducing the risk that a bat will hear the insects. Just imagine how the jungle of that time sounded. The loud chirping of crickets hurts the ears. Then you hear a brachiosaurus hissing. The clicks of pterodactyls shake the sky like thunderclaps. Then you hear the trumpet sounds of different tones somewhere in the jungle. These are Parasar olefus communicating with each other. And then you get scared by a loud Tyrannosaurus siren. What a racket! You'd probably not find peace in such conditions. Fortunately, humans appeared millions of years later. And by the way, scientists have managed to find out and understand what our distant ancestors sounded like. They carefully examined the insert function of the mouth, nose, and throat on the Neanderthal skeleton. Their voices were similar to ours, but the phonetic range of an adult Neanderthal was the same as if they were two to three years old. It was like mumbling without consonant sounds. The study of the skull couldn't recreate precisely the sound of Neanderthals. But in 2007, scientists extracted DNA samples from their bones. They found a variation of the gene that responds to human speech. Scientists believe that Neanderthals fought with Homo sapiens. You know, our family tree. As a result of this conflict, their kind became extinct. But the found gene points they could have had other connections with each other. Perhaps Neanderthals could understand their language and even pronounce some words. The Liger is probably the most popular hybrid animal, and an incredibly large cat. You won't see them in the wild. People most deliberately breed them. Lions and tigers don't even inhabit the same areas. So, a Liger is a mix of a male lion and a female tiger, and they can grow to be very big in a pretty short period of time. They're actually the biggest cats in the world. Hercules, the largest recorded Liger, is a real example of that. 922 pounds and 10.8 feet long. Imagine taking him for a walk. Ligers are mostly way bigger than either of their parents. In most cases, they behave and look more like lions than tigers. But they have some tiger traits too. For example, striped backs, and they're crazy about swimming. The Tigan. Nobody could fault you for thinking the Tigan and Liger are basically the same animal. I mean, they're both a combination of tigers and lions. 
but a taigan comes from a crossbreeding of a male tiger and a female lion. They're usually smaller than their parents, and definitely much smaller than their giant, could you call them siblings? In most cases, they inherit charming looks from their tiger fathers, but they get some interesting traits from their mother's side too. For example, love for socialization and the ability to roar. Hands down, one of the rarest hybrid animals in the world are wolfins. These fellas are a mashup of a female bottlenose dolphin and a male false killer whale. Its name might make you think differently, but a false killer whale belongs to the dolphin family. They're not even related to killer whales. Wolfins are such an interesting 50-50 mix and balance of their parents. They have dark gray skin, the perfect blend of a black false killer whale and light gray dolphin skin. Dolphins have anywhere between 80 and 100 teeth. False killer whales have 44. And their hybrid young is halfway, with 66 teeth in total. What would it look like if algae and a slug paired? No need to imagine. You have a green sea slug to check the result. It lives in salt marshes in Canada and New England. And it's possibly the weirdest hybrid creature you'll see in this video, and in general. Part plant, part animal. So, some slugs seem to have been very sneaky while stealing the genes from innocent algae that they have eaten to enable them to look like this. Since they're partially a plant, they can produce the plant pigment called chlorophyll. That means these unusual slugs can even photosynthesize. That's the process plants use to turn sunlight into energy. So they produce their own molecules that contain energy without having to eat anything at all. When scientists first discovered it, a green sea slug was the first case of a multicellular animal that's able to produce chlorophyll. What do you get when you mix a male leopard and a female lion? You get an interesting hybrid called a lepin. These animals grow to be almost as big as lions, but they still have shorter legs, similar to their father leopard. They inherit some of his other traits too, like a love for climbing and swimming. You can have a union with a male lion and a female leopard too, and the result is called a leopard. Male lions are usually around 10 feet long and weigh about 500 pounds. The female leopard is way smaller, only 5 feet long with a weight of about 80 pounds. The difference in size here is too big, so this pairing really doesn't happen that often. Okay, how about a buffalo and a cow? When you were little, maybe you thought that they could be a good match, but in reality, the combination creates an unusual hybrid animal called a beefalo. Not many types of hybrid animals can reproduce on their own, but a beefalo can do it. When a grizzly and a polar bear get together, it results in a growler bear, or pizzly bear, or grizzlar, whichever you like the most. You can see them even in the wild. These two types of bears have a mutual contempt for one another. Yep, they're not good at living together in a mutual habitat. But even though it's rare, the love can still happen and result in these cute caramel-colored hybrid growler bears. In most cases, they'll be a bit smaller than polar bears, on average 60 inches tall at the shoulder, and approximate weight 1,000 pounds. But they're well equipped for surviving in warmer climates thanks to the genes they got from their grizzly family side. Now let's get to one pretty tough fella, the jag lion. As its name implies, it's the hybrid of a jaguar and a lion. We don't know much about these intriguing big cats because only a few of them exist. But there was an unintentional mixing between a black jaguar and a lioness, which eventually resulted in two jag lion cubs. One had a dark gray coat with black spots because of the dominant melanin gene black jaguars usually have. The other one had a lion color and the rosette pattern spots that remind you of a jaguar. Yep, you already know it, there are also liguars, a hybrid of a female jaguar and a male lion. That's some colorful family. Speaking of wild cats, have you ever heard of a savanna cat? Savanna cats are in both categories of house pets and exotic hybrids, since they're a mix of a domestic cat and a wild African serval hybrid animal. We're talking about striking animals, almost as big as a domestic cat. But what gives them their exotic look are their tall bodies, slender forms, and spotted coats. These cats are extremely loyal, intelligent, and loving creatures. Here's one unexpected mixture, a zebroid. 
Technically, it's a name people use to describe a hybrid of a zebra and any equine species. But when you pair a zebra and a horse, their young is called a zorse. Zebra hybrids mostly look like whichever animals they've been crossbred with, but with the striped coat of a pure zebra. Most of these hybrid creatures don't even have fully striped coats. You can mostly see the stripes on non-white areas of their bodies and legs. Speaking of zebra hybrids, check out this adorable creature. It's called a zonkey, or zedonk, zebras, zanky, eh, take your pick. They're mostly either tan, gray, or brown in color. You'll distinguish them by unique stripes that are darkest on their legs and belly. Unlike some hybrids, such as the liger, zonkeys can normally live in the wild. In fact, that's where you can find them, living life to the fullest across savannas and open woodland, mostly in Africa. Can you guess what a geep is? Yep, a combination of goat and sheep, and definitely one of the most adorable and cuddliest hybrid creatures in this video. Geeps are very rare. Some experts even believe it's possible that they're not true hybrids, but just sheep with certain genetic abnormalities. After all, sheep and goats do carry different numbers of chromosomes, which means cross-species mixes are almost impossible. When a camel and a llama get together, you get a cute little thing called a comma. Similar to beefalo, the comma also produces the best economic traits of both its parents. The first one was born in 1998. Commas don't have camel humps. Their body is covered in soft, fleecy fur, similar to their llama side of the family. They can drink big amounts of water at a time, so they can survive with almost no water at all for pretty long periods. The koi wolf is a hybrid where nothing looks that unusual to most people, since the coyote and the wolf are not that drastically different in their looks. After all, these two species only diverged around 200,000 years ago. Now they're still able to mate and bring koi wolf cubs to the world. People living in eastern Canada and the US might be familiar with these smart adaptable animals that inhabit their forests, neighborhood parks, or sometimes even cities. These hybrids have emerged over the past century or so. And they've picked up the characteristics of both their parents. When a koi wolf is fully grown, it's somewhere in between the size of both parents. But it's also 55 pounds heavier than pure coyotes, and has a bigger jaw, longer legs, smaller ears, and a bushier tail. Check out the narluga, an extremely rare creature whose parents are a narwhal and a beluga whale. It's a pretty strange animal, but far from being lonely, they mostly live in the North Atlantic. Scientists had suspected their existence for decades. In 1990, they found an unusual-looking whale skull located in an Inuit hunter's tool shed in Greenland. People from that area said that there were other similar-looking animals, and they fit the description of neither a beluga whale nor a narwhal. People said they had gray skin, narwhal-like tails, and beluga-like flippers. Narwhals and beluga whales are similar in size, and they share a family, the Monodontidae family. So it may not even be that surprising that they're able to successfully breed in the wild.